Buongiorno. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. I would like uh, to welcome uh, Professor Lazonek, uh, who is uh, at the Trento Festival e of Economics for the first uh, time. My name is Roberto Mania. I am a journalist uh, of the Italian daily La Repubblica. And I will try and introduce Professor Lazonek's lecture. First of all, I would like to recall the past, because you see, at a certain point, the liberist uh, ideology uh, gained ground, and an alternative uh, thought was missing, a different approach and a different perspective in, tr in trying and understanding what was happening. An alternative voice was missing. It was uh, a sort of deafening uh, silence among intellectuals, and that also involved uh, not only intellectuals but also journalists uh, who were too lazy in uh, uh, addressing this issue, and they only focused uh, on the market and the centrality of the market, uh, neglecting what was happening on the other side, that is, the social disaggregation that was taking place, uh, inequalities that were growing, uh, the disparities and discrepancies in society and uh, the peripheral areas of the globalized world were changing and people were not realizing that. We r realized at a certain point that there was a fragmentation and uh, there was a breaking down uh, of uh, social classes and walks of life uh, and uh, I think of the middle classes in Europe and also in the United States. Uh, and uh, social partners, too, did not actually act. It was laziness, really, an intellectual laziness that prevailed, uh, as if uh, the market could uh, do everything, uh, as if uh, money, producing money, could also have uh, a democratic role in uh, redistributing resources. But it was not like that. The 2007, 8 and 8 recession and the following years compelled that we reviewed our perspective and, under, and we understood that there was another way of looking at things. It was not only Wall Street indexes, it was not only benefits and bonuses uh, for top executives that mattered and uh, th their pays uh, were linked uh, to the trend of stock markets, and, uh, but that was not the whole picture because that happened to their advantage, to part uh, of uh, the executives and the elite, but not the broad part of large part of society and communities. So we had an extraction of value instead of value creation, as Professor Lazonik says. And the word value extraction is uh, the core of the problem. An article was published in 2014 by um, Professor Lazonik in Harvard Business Review. And uh, it was uh, entitled Profits uh, Without Prosperity, as if the role of capitalists uh, had gone lost uh, and had interpreted and performed a different function. That is not something for the community, whereby businesses and corporations are part of the community and, va and create value, but rather extract value. Professor Lazanek was one of the critical voices of what was happening, and he did so from the very beginning because he understood that, along with other intellectuals, that capitalism was short-sighted, that it was diseased, that it was capitalism based on rent without entrepreneurs, that it was conditioned by short-term approaches. And so he developed uh, his original and very interesting uh, uh, theory of innovative uh, uh, businesses, uh, which uh, uh, serves the purpose uh, of putting remedy uh, to the flaws of capitalism. We had then a metamorphosis uh, of, uh, uh, of capitalism, and uh, the uh, managers, the executives, uh, the elites actually did not perform their role, and this paved the way to many problems, including populism in the United States uh, and also elsewhere in the world. So Professor Lazanik, first of all, dismantles uh, the classic theories and uh, uh, shows uh, the contradictions in it and uh, its uh, frailty. 
the aspect I would like uh, to focus here is uh, the theorization of the monopolist uh, business. That is the, the frail element. So this is the intellectual direction uh, uh, followed, uh, and uh, that is uh, supported by several theories, uh, starting from Karl Marx uh, to innovative businesses, which again are part of the community and perform something for the community. And these are terms that we had stopped using in the past years. An innovative business uh, brings together uh, capital and labor and resources in order to produce innovative services. Professor Lazonik wrote that the essence of this is cumulative uh, learning. It is uh, an, an entity of people, uh, of individuals uh, um, engaging in a virtuous and alternative uh, pathway, something that we saw had stopped happening, something that was revealed by the crisis. So the point it has to be to create value and not simply pay top executives. I jotted down a number of figures, and they are in incredible, really. And uh, I understood uh, that no barrier was raised against uh, this diffusion of the liberalist uh, um, approach uh, and uh, ideology. In uh, the period between 2004 and 2013, 454 uh, um, uh, uh, SNP uh, companies used uh, $3,400 billion uh, in order uh, to repurchase their own stocks. And that was a percentage of 51% uh, of the, their net income, while an additional 35% was destined uh, to distribute dividends. In, that, in those 10 years, approximately 9,000 businesses in the United States altogether used $6,900 billion for uh, buybacks. And uh, that was a percentage of 43% of their net uh, income, while dividends absorbed an additional 47%. So corporations uh, such as uh, ExxonMobil between 2003 and 2012 purchased uh, on a daily basis at least uh, 300 million of their own uh, shares and stocks. So it is trillions of dollars uh, that instead uh, of being used uh, to pay for labor, for invested capital, and for growth of the community, actually paid uh, and remunerated uh, the top managers. It was a manipulation of the value of stocks at the metamorphosis of the system of allocation of resources. This happened uh, in all sectors. And here I'm coming closer to the very topic that will be addressed uh, by Professor Lazanek. This system he also included uh, the big pharma company model. Between 2003 and 2012, Pfizer, for instance, as also uh, Johnson & Johnson did, used 71% of their profits uh, to for buybacks, uh, and 75% uh, was used for dividends. So they actually used more for buyback uh, op uh, operations uh, than what they actually uh, uh, gained. In the United States, uh, drugs uh, have uh, doubled the price of other countries in the world. Big pharma uh, companies uh, state uh, that the, the, the price is due to the fact that they invest in innovation, but probably it is not that. It is not so. This is a central topic because the big uh, pharma companies produce uh, medicines uh, that uh, that have to, uh, that are aimed at improving the quality of our life uh, and make us live longer, improving life expectancy and uh, cure us. So that is the theory, at least. And that is on paper. And uh, I, I think that Professor Lazonik will address on exactly this point because probably there is something else behind all this. You have the floor, Professor Lazonik. Thank you very much, and uh, um, thank you for having me in Trento, beautiful city. I've been in Italy many times, but never in Trento. And thanks to the Institute uh, for New Economic Thinking for both bringing me here and also for funding this research, which uh, has been generous. Okay, um, yes, uh, the, here's a picture of uh, the percentage of uh, national health expenditures in the United States that go to prescription drugs. It went down I in the uh, 70s into the 80s, but then started going up again. Um, uh, uh, the bigger picture is that the United States spends about uh, 18 to 19 percent of GDP 
on health expenditures. Uh, uh, this is no other country is more than 11 percent, and a lot of this is because people are making money without really delivering health services, a and pharma is one of them. And in the pharmaceutical industry, there's a, a widespread discussion uh, about a productivity crisis. A lot of money goes in, and uh, we do have miracle drugs every once in a while, but given the amount of resources that's devoted uh, to drug development, um, and I'll show you some of the figures for government uh, uh, resources, taxpayer money in the United States, uh, the, uh, the productivity is, is not all that high. Um, there's two parts of the problem, I'm gonna, and I'm going to mention some different dimensions of this problem, but one is that we have the old economy, the old pharma companies, companies like Merck, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, they uh, ha have gotten into a model where they're acquiring other companies that have developed drugs. They're under patent protection. Uh, in 1995, uh, the patent protection was extended from uh, 17 years to 20 years, and uh, they then just try to get as much money out of uh, those patented drugs as they can and do very little of their own drug development. And we trace their pipelines and we can see that this is the case. Uh, then you have uh, some of the new, what we call the new economy companies. These really started uh, uh, in the late 70s and 80s, the biotech revolution. And uh, many of them are listed on the more speculative stock exchange, at least it was in the 80s, NASDAQ. And they uh, uh, came up with a number of uh, blockbuster drugs in the 80s that uh, were, many people in the industry called the low-hanging fruit. It was there ready to be picked because of government uh, uh, funding of, of, of pharmaceutical drugs and biotech drugs for, for many decades. Um, uh, but then you had increasingly companies saw that they could make a lot of money even if no drugs produced or if they just got a hold of drugs, and, and some of the most financialized companies are not the old companies, uh, but the new ones. And we'll see one which is well known as Gilead Sciences. Um, and I'm going to explain why this is the case. Okay, um, uh, there's a different dimensions to this broken uh, business model that you have in the United States. This is uh, the director of research with Dr. Zalbora, some testimony he gave. Uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, and basically talks about this in terms of access to medicines, that, that the medicines people need are not being produced. Uh, they could be produced, they could be produced profitably, the companies don't want to produce them because they want to pr produce the ones that where they can gouge prices and they can, uh, uh, not necessarily ones where they have to sell en masse to, uh, uh, to, lo to, uh, to low income uh, populations. Um, the uh, uh, there's been lots of talk, and I know here as well, about the opioid e epidemic. Uh, and uh, the drug companies, some of the drug companies are just uh, implicated deeply in just creating drugs that are not high quality in the sense that they destroy people's lives. They don't, they don't uh, uh, save people's lives or ease pain. Uh, they destroy people's lives. Uh, here's a very good article by Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, who I think you all know of, and uh, called Gilead's Greed That Kills, about this company, Gilead uh, Sciences, which got a hold of a drug for hepatitis C that it did not develop, uh, and uh, charged really very high prices for it. And uh, in this article, he says that uh, it's a, a company driven by unquenchable greed, which I agree with. And he says that Gilead CEO, John C. Martin, took home a reported $19 million last year, that was in 2014, in compensation, the spoils of untrammeled greed. And you can see at the bottom, it says that he, that's not what he took home. He took home $193 million. Now, I'll explain that. That's uh, part of the complication here. People don't really understand how much money some of these people are making out of uh, exploiting the, the position they have in, in drugs that control or drugs that uh, people need a uh, matter of life and death. Uh, we've had the recent case of a company called Valiant, uh, which is just totally price gouging company, gets hold of uh, existing drugs, tries to gouge prices. It got a lot of publicity. It actually has failed. Uh, we don't need to cry too much, but the, uh, the, the hedge fund guy who was involved in this, uh, William Ackman, is, said it was set to loss $3 billion with the, with the decline of the stock price. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, 
a summary of their business model by a CEO of a company, Genzyme, which was uh, uh, a company that did develop uh, on its own in the early 80s uh, with the National Institutes of Health funding uh, a miracle drug that is only uh, for a really rare disease with about five or 6,000 people in the world use it. Um, uh, now, to, to understand this, we have to uh, uh, understand what economists can't say about it. Because economists, as was mentioned, uh, do not have a theory of innovative enterprise. Um, economists, in fact, have a theory of the uninnovative enterprise, the unproductive enterprise. And then they call it perfect competition, and they can't understand what's going on in an indu any industry, really, where, in fact, the purpose is to get a high-quality product at a low cost. That, and that is what raises our standard of living. And the low cost does not come at the expense of low wages. It actually comes with higher wages because you get productivity. And that productivity is generated not just in the pharmaceutical industry, but virtually every industry within companies. It's not generated on the, the labor markets. Uh, and this is, this is the big failing of economics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this because it has to be understood in this context. Um, the... Uh, Innovation process uh, has three characteristics, uncertain, uh, collective, and cumulative. So nobody can say what the outcome is going to be, and that is certainly true in when you try to develop a pharmaceutical drug. You can spend 10 years, billions of dollars, and, 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 and have a failure. Uh, it's collective. Lots of people have to be working together uh, in a learning process to generate the new technology, to access the markets, uh, and that's why we have business organizations. That's what they do. That's the essence of it. And that's the essence of the innovation process. And it's cumulative. It takes time. And it's not just the passage of time. It's because the learning processes take time. So it's a collective and cumulative learning process. And that's why we need finance, uh, what people often call patient capital. We need that money uh, uh, controlled by these companies so they can get from the point in which they make the investment to when they finally have a product to sell on the market and can generate some uh, financial uh, returns from uh, making that investment. And again, it may never happen. It's uncertain. So, and often companies fail, but enough succeed that we have, whether it's Italy, United States, France, Germany, uh, Korea now, Japan, high standards of living because of these innovative enterprises, essential to understanding the economy. Okay. Now, there's some characteristics, just, well, I'll go over very quickly, of the innovative enterprise that need to be understood because the innovation process is uncertain, collective, and cumulative. Uh, and these are what I call uh, behavioral conditions, and I show them here. Uh, strategic control. It matters who really is running companies, what their incentives and abilities are. And if the people who are running these companies do not have the ability to understand the innovation process, they're not going to be able to lead the innovation process. Often, if, even if they do understand it, uh, we'll see that they don't have the incentive to uh, uh, sustain the innovation process. They have the incentive to make lots of money for themselves in any case, and this has become the part of the broken U.S. business model. Uh, you need to integrate people into this learning process. That means you have to share the gains with them. That the gains do not just come from themselves. They come from the very productivity of the people, but not just individually, collectively. And in some industries, it's more complex. Some industries, it's less complex. In pharmaceutical, it's very complex, those learning processes. And then you need financial commitment uh, b to sustain that process. So these are what I call the theory of innovative enterprise. This is what I think in every introductory course and everywhere in the world people should be learning about no one learns anything close to this, except if they take my courses. Um, if you are successful in this, you get a high-quality, low-cost product. But for any company that is trying to do this, there is a problem that the very investment in innovation, and not just in the plant and equipment, but particularly in the people and keeping the people employed and, and uh, training them, retaining them, rewarding those people, giving people careers, which is not out of charity, which is out of the need to develop these high-quality, low-cost products, that's high cost. And it might be high quality, but it might be very high cost. Uh, but once you can get a higher quality product than competitors, uh, you can start getting a larger extent of the market, and you can start spreading out those fixed costs. And that's really economies of scale. And some companies then get also economies of scope by having different types of products that are using 
uh, these fixed capabilities. And it's not just, again, plant and equipment, it's, it's labor really as a fixed cost, which is fundamental to not only innovation, but our higher standards of living because we have careers as a result of that. Okay, and uh, this then affects economic performance. When you have innovation, uh, it is potentially possible for lots of different, what we might call stakeholders, to gain. And you can see them here, I won't go through them all, including consumers who get the high quality, lower cost products. And then when we have this, and we add it all up, and we have enough companies doing this in the economy, we have what I call sustainable prosperity. We have at least a foundation for what I call stable and equitable growth. Why? Because people are, have careers developing these high quality products. They get a share of the gains, there's a share of prosperities. This again does not happen on the labor market. It fundamentally happens in these major business organizations and we get economic growth. And this is what we want. We want stable and equitable economic growth and we need to have innovative enterprise. And this goes way beyond pharma or any other industries. This is generally true. Now if we look at the US economy, these are some data on uh, the size of firms. We know we have a large firm. Now, in Italy, we do have the phenomenon, which I think is a very important one, of uh, the industrial districts. Uh, some are more fragile than others. It's not always small firms. It might be a collectivity of firms. But in the United States and uh, in many other countries, and even in, in Italy in certain sectors, of course, uh, you have very large companies uh, that uh, compete on, on global markets. And in the United States, basically, if you look at just the companies, uh, 5,000 people or more on here, uh, average over 20,000 employees. <laughs> That's very big companies, but they, they are uh, about a third of the vis uh, business uh, se sector labor force, which is about 81% of the total in the United States, 38% uh, of payrolls, and about 44% uh, of revenue. So there's about, if you take that cut, about 1,900 companies, what they do uh, determines how the rest of the economy uh, uh, operates and performs. Okay, now in the ph pharmaceutical industry, as in uh, almost every, in, and every uh, across the whole U.S. economy, uh, we have a disease, and it's called maximizing shareholder value. It's a disease with which uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily take the people sitting here as, as, as a sample, but uh, I would say that if you did a survey, 99% of economists would say, yes, it's good for companies to maximize shareholder value. That leads to efficiency in the economy as a whole. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll explain very briefly why that's highly problematic and why it's wrong. Um, but uh, when you do that, you end up having the phenomena which were mentioned in the introduction, uh, people at the top, uh, making uh, uh, extraordinary, uh, 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 or taking, I should say, really extraordinary uh, remuneration. And, uh, and a lot of people not, get, not getting very much. Uh, companies buying back their stock, distributing uh, uh, dividends, and uh, uh, buying back stock from shareholders. Uh, and it, it pervades the U.S. economy, but it pervades the U.S. pharma with a vengeance because the U.S. government gives uh, these companies lots of advantages in generating drugs that they don't have to pay for, like government spending, high drug prices, and they, they use this to enrich, <coughs> enrich uh, the, themselves, the CEOs, and increasingly these hedge fund people, although some people like Ackman lost some money, that's too bad. Uh, okay, now the people who put this forward are called you know, agency theorists, and the, the notion, it's rooted in the theory of the market economy, neoclassical economics. And the notion is we've got a market economy out there. Everybody gets uh, a guaranteed return for labor, whatever the products are producing, except the common shareholder. They're the only ones who take risk in the economy. And therefore, if the, if the company generates profits, they should control what happens to those profits. And if they take losses, they, they'll take losses. And when there are profits, uh, they don't necessarily just leave them with those companies. They'll go and take them through the financial markets, particularly through the stock market, and allocate them to their more efficient uses. And this is uh, the theory of, of, of how you should allocate resource in the economy and the role of shareholders in the economy. Uh, this is uh, the guru of maximizing shareholder values, a, a guy named Michael Jensen who brought this uh, along with Chicago School Economics uh, to the world in the 70s and 80s, and then he was hired at Harvard Business School in 1985, and I was there 
starting in 84 uh, and over the time when after he was hired. No one was talking about this ideology in 1984 at Harvard Business School. Everybody was talking about it after. And this was also, coincidentally, uh, the era of Reaganomics, the rise of Wall Street, people not going into industry, going to Wall Street, and the, growth, uh, the beginnings of growth of huge I income inequality. And, and this theory, if there is a legitimizing theory, which there is here, it's responsible for it. And if you want to pick one person who is responsible for it, it's uh, this particular guy, Michael Jensen. Okay, now what's the critique? Fundamental problems with, with their assumptions. Uh, <coughs> the uh, sh shareholders are not the only ones that take risk. In fact, they take very little risk because they just buy and sell shares because the market's liquid and they can sell those shares very quickly if they don't want it. It's what is long called the Wall Street walk in, in the United States. Uh, who takes the risk? I, as a taxpayer in the United States, uh, when I pay my taxes and it goes to fund roads or it goes to fund the National Institutes of Health, which we'll see some of the numbers, I'm taking a risk that the companies will not use this well, these resources we give to them. And even if you have a given tax rate, uh, I won't get the return because the economy won't do well. Okay, now if it does and we have a given tax rate, we might get a fair return. But there's also political, that's an economic risk that they won't do well. There's a political risk that they'll start arguing that we need lower taxes in order to do well, which is precisely what they do being legitimized by shareholder value ideology. Uh, and workers face, face, face risk as well. It's a different type of risk. If I go and work for a company and I'm involved in a collective and cumulative learning process, uh, I am generating the products of the future, the productivity of the future, and I would say everybody is involved in this in some way unless you're just the most irreplaceable uh, commodity, uh, then I'm going to get the gains, Not even if I'm paid today, I'm going to expect the gains in the future, and I'm going to generate, be part of generating those gains in the future. Someone comes in and says, no, those, that's my money, they're, they're taking my money. That's it's basically what maximizing shareholder value did. Jensen disgorged the cash flow belongs to shareholders. It took the workers' money. Uh, <coughs> and sure enough, my article, Profits of Prosperity, would say that you know, I tried to explain this in terms of the growing inequality of income distribution in the United States that everybody knows about. The irony of shareholder value ideology is that shareholders take very little risk. They just buy and sell shares, and they don't actually invest in the productive capabilities of the company. I can give you an example uh, <coughs> outside the pharmaceutical industry, uh, but a relative, uh, uh, new company, Apple. The only time anybody ever, Apple ever got any money from the public, public stock market it was in 1980 when it did its initial public offering. It got $93 million, which is nothing. And, and, and even Steve Jobs had sold all his shares by 1985. So uh, the, the current shareholders do not, have never funded that company. They're, they're going to the company to get dividends to hopefully a higher, a higher stock price, but they do not fund the company. So it's a total misconception. Uh, foisted on us by the theory of the market economy, the stock markets actually fund the economy. They don't. They're a way of taking money out of the economy, and it's always been that way uh, in the United States. Um, the, yep. Hmm? Okay. Sorry, I, I was going a little too fast for the interpreters, which I promised them I wouldn't do. <laughs> okay, so slower. <laughs> and, uh, um, they also told me there's many more words in Italian than in English, so that <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so maximizing shareholder value, what I call MSV, is a theory of value extraction, not value creation. And, uh, and it's a way of taking money out of the economy rather than a way of putting uh, money in the economy. And we can see this in this graph. So this is from uh, the Federal Reserve, Federal uh, Flow of Funds data. This is net equity issues, is stock issued by companies minus uh, stock they take off the market largely through stock buybacks. And the red line is non-financial uh, companies or industrial companies, and we can see uh, <coughs> it, it really around 1984 it starts becoming negative. It's, it's, it's volatile, but it becomes very negative after 2003, and it remains highly, highly negative. Uh, that spike in uh, the blue line is financial companies. They did issue shares to the U.S. government when they got bailed out. So, so they have positive net uh, equity issues. Uh, I converted this into uh, uh, numbers uh, in 2015 dollars just so you could see 
uh, the growth in the size of this uh, funding of the stock market this uh, distribution. And uh, you can see that uh, basically how it grows in that first column to four and a half trillion dollars over the uh, the decade 2006 to 2015, and just as a, uh, a way of giving it some control over the relative to the size of the economy, I show it in terms of uh, the uh, uh, percentage of GDP. And it's become bigger and bigger, more and more systemic. Uh, this is a picture not of net equity issues, but of uh, gross distribution of uh, dividends and buybacks uh, by the same companies over a long period of time from 1981 up through 2015. Uh, and basically, in the beginning of the 80s, you did not have uh, buybacks on any uh, appreciable scale. There were some changes that were made when Ronald Reagan got elected uh, under dere deregulation that facilitated or encouraged companies to do these buybacks. They haven't done them instead of dividends. They've done them on top of dividends and they've grown over time and, we and absorb more and more of net income, which I show here. It's a little complicated, but these are some of the numbers which were uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, so if you take uh, if the same companies over a decade, this th case 2006 to 2015, uh, 459 companies in the S&P 500, it was 3.9 trillion in total in buybacks, another 2.7 trillion in dividends, that's 91% of, of net income. And by the way, a lot of the, the rest of their net income is held abroad uh, where they avoid U.S. taxes. Uh, so there's very little that uh, they're using out of net income to reinvest. Uh, this is, uh, shows you some of the, uh, well, the top 25 repurchasers over that decade, the companies, and often, uh, as was mentioned, over 100% of their net income is, is going to uh, distribution to shareholders. Uh, this, are <coughs> out of that, uh, the top 50, these are companies in healthcare. Uh, so there's uh, eight of them, I believe, and uh, five of them are pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Amgen, uh, Merck, and Gilead Sciences. So these are ranked by the, the amount of repurchase they did over that decade. Uh, so they're well represented here. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, this article, Profits Without Prosperity, uh, uh, I critiqued this uh, argument, uh, and I did it in terms of this change in this graph, which is shown back here, uh, which many people have used. I didn't invent this. Uh, uh, this is the change in productivity uh, of labor, percentage change cumulatively over time, uh, mapped against the cumulative uh, percent change in productivity. And uh, up until the mid-1970s, late 1970s, uh, rate of change in labor uh, wages uh, tracked the rate of change in productivity. And I argue this is mainly because large corporations, which dominated the economy, had a retain and reinvest resource allocation regime. And this is what brought the U.S. to be a world leader, not j in, in every industry. Uh, that is, that it, where it's a world leader, uh, it kept people, gave them a career with one company, shared the prosperity with them. You had a uh, uh, emergence of a middle class, and by the way, it was mainly a, a white middle class. So when Donald Trump says, "Make America great again," and if, if it's something to reality, it's "Make America white again." It, if he if he understood anything about history, which is not clear, uh, th this might be what he's referring to, or what to what. Uh, but that broke down. Uh, in uh, the uh, late, from the late 70s, and increasingly you have this gap between productivity and wages, and now even productivity is slowing. Okay, so you you start having a problem, and this problem is because I would argue with you know shareholder value ideology, just taking money out of company, going from what I call retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. I uh, retain people, money, you invest in the company uh, to downsize in labor force cutting wages and distributing the uh, uh, gains to uh, shareholders. Obviously, there's limits to this, but some of the companies that dominate in their industries can do this for a long time with, with, and still remain alive. So there's an integral relation, in my view, between the incomes of the top 1% and the disappearing middle class. These are the uh, Piketty and Says data. You can see if you take the components of uh, the top one-tenth of 1% of incomes, it's increasing that blue portion at the bottom is the, uh, are the, uh, what they call salaries, because the tax data do not show stock-based pay, but that's increasingly stock-based pay. 
Uh, here's the data on uh, stock-based pay of the 500 highest paid U.S. executives uh, each year from 2006 to uh, uh, 2015. Uh, <clears throat> the two bottom parts of the bar, the orange and the purple, are uh, stock-based pay. And it's about anywhere when the stock market's down, 67% or something like that of their total pay. When it's up, uh, 84%. And you can see that the, <clears throat> the uh, average, let's say for 2015, uh, was $32.6 million. Um, this, some of the, they, the, the, this pay actually uh, is, is small relative to the highest paid people who are running hedge funds. Uh, and we put, have this data here, who have been coming increasingly powerful in taking money out of these companies. It's not the only thing hedge funds do, but among these people are, are people who are getting the money out of the companies. Okay, uh, <clears throat> shareholder value undermines innovation. Uh, it uh, separates the people at the top from the rest of the organization. They do well, even if the rest of the organization doesn't do well. It takes away from the career employment, the productivity uh, development of the, through experience of workers, sharing in the productivity gains, which is essential not only to those workers but to the innovation process because that's where the learning occurs. And it drains the company of money that it needs to sustain the innovation process. Now, uh, in the drug industry, uh, it also uh, takes the form of uh, financialization of price gouging, of uh, get charging higher prices, uh, and <clears throat> there's an argument that the industry has made for uh, decades that the reason they charge higher drug prices in the United States is because there's more investment in uh, R&D and innovation uh, in the United States. Uh, well, here's the data on drug prices. I just have a number of graphs here. Uh, they're at least twice what they are everywhere else is the data. If you can see it from uh, that the uh, UK system uh, put out, uh, these are a, a, a number of different drugs that are out there on the market where uh, the price in the United States compared to other countries. Okay, well, that point is clear. Uh, the, uh, for drug prices in the United States are unregulated. Uh, there's no economic rationale for them being unregulated from any theory uh, because they have a, a monopoly for 20, 20 years. Uh, they're really uh, pharmaceutical companies, once they have uh, the monopoly, are like a utility. They should be regulated like a utility, like a monopoly, and, and, and be allowed to charge prices that give a, uh, a, a decent yield to shareholders for, on their dividends. They're not actually getting the money from the stock market. They're getting from the bond market. The more they keep in the money, uh, the better rates they can get from the, you know, money in the company, the better rates in the bond market. They should be regulated from the utility. They're not. Uh, and this argument actually goes way back. This is a newspaper article from 1985. Drug industry accused of, of gouging public. Uh, Waxman attributes price, price hikes to greed. Waxman was a guy named Henry Waxman who just re, uh, retired after uh, you know, about over 30 years in Congress. He was the kind of watchdog of, of the industry. Uh, and he was constantly saying things like he said back in 1985, they're gouging the American public, outrageous price increases, greed on a massive scale, profits at the expense of the sick, the poor, and the elderly. You know, as I said, he retired after, he didn't run the last election. I wonder, I don't know, I never met him. I, I don't know what he thinks now. <laughs> uh, but now the thing is that uh, what they depended on, they bought the, he actually here, uh, uh, there's another part of that article where he calls into question the industry argument, which they made back then, that, that they need these high drug prices to accelerate innovation in the industry. And so he was questioning that. But the way they tried to deal with it was by saying, okay, after 20 years, uh, you won't have a patent, patented drug anymore and there'll be generics. And it turns out that some of the generics still can gouge prices because they have to be safe. Uh, some of the generic companies buy other, uh, other companies, keep the monopoly, etc. So it remains a problem even without, uh, without uh, patents. The, uh, this is funded by the government. There would not be a pharmaceutical industry, probably not just in, 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 in uh, the United States but around the world, without U.S. government funding of this because, in fact, European and Japanese companies are very good at making use of the U.S. environment. Uh, and, and actually, if we've been studying some European companies. If, if they're non-financialized, they go into the U.S., they get access to uh, the knowledge that's being produced 
through Na National Institutes of Health funding, and they get the high drug prices, and they actually do put it into innovation, they can become leaders. And in some companies in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, like Roche and Novartis, are doing better than American companies because of this in drug development. Uh, these are numbers going back to 1938 on the National Institutes of Health. Uh, uh, this is in 2016 dollars, their total funding. Uh, it just is about a trillion dollars in total going back to them. And uh, uh, the, this is double what it was in real terms in the 1990s. Now, uh, it actually hasn't increased innovation. It increases a lot of startups who get listed on the stock market without a product, and people make money even if no products produce. Uh, uh, we call them product list IPOs or PIPOs, and you do not uh, actually get, in many cases, uh, drugs developed, but you get people making lots and lots of money through speculation on the market uh, uh, about these companies. Uh, they're also supported by something which Europe adopted in 2001, uh, called the Orphan Drug Act to support uh, rare and genetic di uh, diseases. Um, we uh, did uh, looked at all the blockbuster drugs, drugs that in any one year had a billion dollars or more in sale, and uh, really the modern industry, the industry as we know it now, uh, was based on orphan drugs. So this, these are the orphan drugs uh, from 1991 on when a lot of these drugs started coming onto the market. And uh, these are the ones, the non-orphan drugs uh, that were blockbusters. And some of them actually are derivative of orphan drugs. So that was another part of the support the government has given to the industry. Uh, here's a, a report in uh, 1984 when Francois Mitterrand was in Silicon Valley uh, and was being told by a particularly greedy uh, venture capitalist named Tom Perkins, who's still around, uh, that they had created everything in that industry. And it was from Kleiner and Perkins was a uh, venture capital company, was first uh, backed uh, Genentech, a, a, a biotech company. Uh, and uh, a, a, a scientist who had won a Nobel Prize spoke up and said, where were you guys when all the government was doing all the funding? Uh, and he goes on to say, I cannot imagine that had it not been NIH funding research, there would have been a biotechnology industry. This is the scientist Paul Berg. Uh, as a footnote to this, Paul Berg uh, later was a, uh, uh, for many years, a, on the advisory council of this greedy company, Gilead Sciences, and we added up that he made about $23 million uh, 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 being on the advisory council for that company. So everybody gets their take uh, sooner or later. Okay. Um, you don't end up with a lot of innovation. Now, I uh, have some numbers here. Uh, just we, what we did is out of the S&P 500, we pulled out uh, the pharmaceutical companies. There were 18 companies, and basically we see that uh, uh, they uh, are uh, uh, basically more financialized than, than industry in general. They, they are highly financialized. So it's not simply that they are doing this. They are doing it with a vengeance, as I said earlier. Uh, companies like Pfizer and Merck, among the largest, they've been doing it for decades. Uh, they've just been uh, 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 there to create shareholder value, that is, to boost stock prices. Uh, we had one article that was actually uh, done at the request of INET, uh, and we wrote an article uh, about uh, Pfizer's, uh, when Pfizer was trying to go to Ireland to get out of U.S. taxes, and uh, the CEO uh, said in an interview that they couldn't compete because of U.S. taxes, and then we, at the bottom there, uh, we looked at what they had spent on buybacks and dividends, five times what they had paid in U.S. taxes. So he said, and he said that, that U.S. companies were competing with one hand tied behind their back. So I then kind of photoshopped him uh, with some golden handcuffs. And if, you know, that's why they can't compete, because he wants to have his high executive pay. Uh, Pfizer is among the worst. It is probably is the worst of the old economy companies, just gouging prices. And uh, uh, there are here are some more data on now uh, the explosion of executive pay. Some of these companies that started in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, Gilead Sciences is one of them. They were really started just to make money out of the drug industry. They saw that the business model was there, and they were going to exploit it, and they've exploited it very well. Uh, this is, uh, we took for every year from 2006 to 2015, a little small to see, 
but the top six uh, uh, executives by what they're paid in the industry and the percent from stock-based pay. Uh, Gilead Sciences uh, CEO John C. Martin, who I mentioned before, is in every one of those years. He starts at number six and ends up at number one. Um, the, they are doing again this, they're doing this to a more extreme than, than the rest of the industry. Uh, there's another problem here, which I'll just talk, touch on briefly, again, research we did for INET, uh, that everybody's measuring executive pay wrong. Uh, because they're using, why are they, well, basically why are they using it? They're wrong because of crappy economics. They're using Black Shoals, Merton option pricing models, which assumes there's not much volatility in the stock market, when in fact that's what it's all about. That's how you get high executive pay. So we've gone through this. I won't go into any details of this, but if you actually measure it correctly, and this is what I mentioned about this guy, Martin, making $193 million in uh, 2014 when his, it was reported that he made $19 million, that's a phony estimated uh, um, number. That comes out of bad economics, and what, we know what he actually made. And they, they have the same number for 2015, which is his last year of CEO, uh, 19 million, which was prospectively what he might get from the, the uh, stock options that he had. In fact, what he took home was 234 million. So it was about 400 million in two years. Uh, nobody knows how much uh, 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 exactly uh, Gilead expended developing the drug, which really created a bonanza for them, uh, the two drugs, Sovaldi and uh, Har Harvoni. Uh, but nobody thinks it's more than 200 million because they bought the company for about 11 billion. Of course, buying it for 11 billion, they knew that they could, uh, in the United States, just jack up the price as high as they wanted. Uh, but he, if, if that's true, if it was 200 million, he himself uh, had nothing to do with developing this drug other than uh, he's really not a drug developer. He's a, he's a financial engineer. Uh, he got 400 million out of him just for those two years. Uh, there's another company that's been in the news, uh, was in the news. Uh, this is an uh, innovation that happened in 1977, uh, gouging the price of uh, 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 EpiPens, which are injections that you get if you have allergies and kids use them in schools, uh, and they report the wrong numbers on, on that CEO. Okay, so there's a lot of problems here, and I'm coming just toward the end of this, and I'll wrap up with what should be done about it. Uh, I recently have something on the INET website about the problem of uh, not just people who have blue collar jobs, lost work, or you know, a lot of the focus on now, now that they're the base of this terrible person who's uh, running the US government, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's happening to PhDs, it's happening to all kinds of people. They're not getting the careers that they need. The scientific community is not really aware of what's going on. So this is a report called Restoring the Foundation uh, and it's about the need to have more investment uh, in R&D. And they said there's not enough R&D. And here where I kind of bolded this, this sentence in there, which is in their executive summary, uh, they said you need to have these breakthrough discoveries. It says, yet companies finding it increasingly difficult to justify such long-term investments in a market environment focus on short-term results have made it clear that the federal government must continue to be the primary funder of basic research. Now, I could say something really crude here to these people, but why would you accept that market environment as a given? Okay, and that is not the problem. They're getting plenty of government funding. Now, overall, government funding is down relative to what it used to be. Again, some research we did for INET, uh, but R&D is actually not down, and in this industry, government funding is way up. So straighten up the act and, and get these companies to be using the money that they're getting to invest in drug development. Okay, how do you do this? Uh, you get rid of buybacks. They're just gouging the market. It'd be easy actually to get rid of them because they've never even gone through Congress as something that uh, is said that companies can do. Uh, you regulate executive pay. You tie executive pay to how everybody does uh, in the company, to how the customers do, uh, not to the stock market, which is often driven much more by speculation, manipulation than by innovation. Uh, you put representatives of taxpayers and workers on corporate boards. We have much more interest in what's happening to these companies than these shareholders, and certainly these activist shareholders have nothing to do with it. And so you have to completely change the ideology of 
companies and who runs companies and who they're run for. And I implicate here not just these, these greedy people out there, but the whole economic profession, which has really just dropped the ball on this because they do not understand how a business corporation operates. And I include among them some of the most liberal, progressive members of the economics profession who I will not name. Okay, you fix the tax system. You don't give out tax breaks to people who are just going to use it uh, to enrich themselves. Uh, this happens all over the place. And you launch lots and lots of government programs to ensure, not just in pharmaceuticals, but across the boards, that people have careers that keep them productive over 40 years of their lives, and that's what you need for a prosperous economy. Now, as far as the drug industry in particular, uh, you have to recognize that the purpose of the corporation is not to produce profits, it's to produce high-quality, low-cost drugs. And profits are just an outcome of this process if they do this successfully. Uh, gouging the public, producing drugs that are just the same as drugs that are already on the market or actually hurt people is not uh, the purpose of the corporation. Uh, you have to retain and reinvest your money. It was not going to happen if you have those numbers that I showed you and the incentives for top executives uh, to do these distributions to shareholders that, that exist. Uh, you have to recognize that broad pharmaceutical drugs are necessities. So there is a need to have regulation of, uh, of, 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 of drug prices. Um, and dividends should just be something that you pay when everybody else has been satisfied, uh, which is the, what dividends are supposed to be. And if there is a role for business uh, enterprise in drug development and delivery, well, it's only if it's an innovative enterprise. And I would say that in many case, ways you could argue that this should not even be business enterprise. This could all be done by government in government labs, strategically deciding which medicines the society needs most, having maybe competing labs trying to produce the drugs, and we'd have a much better system. Thank you very much. Grazie. Grazie al professor Lazzoni che ci ha aiutato a guardare really, il mondo delle grandi corporation really americane in un altro modo, quasi una, una revisione dell'impianto intellettuale world. come ci invitano a, a fare e, e Mariana Mazzucato e Jacobs nell'introduzione di un libro che è appena Mariana uscito, Mazzucato Ripensare il capitalismo. Noi siamo d'accordo con il professor Lazzoni che di eh, rispondere ad alcune domande che verranno dal pubblico in, in attesa che ne venga eh, qualcuna. Io vorrei chiedere e so fa, eh, fare una domanda al professor Lei nella, nella prima parte della sua lettura ha detto che il processo di innovazione è incerto, cumulativo, collettivo e ha parlato, ha accennato al modello di distretti italiani. Ora, la domanda che mi veniva ascoltando la sua seconda parte, soprattutto la lezione, è quasi una provocazione. Sono più adatte ai processi innovativi, al cambiamento, all'innovazione, come lei la descrive, le piccole imprese sono legate al modello dei distretti italiani dove so l'innovazione, soprattutto l'innovazione nel campo, all'interno della fabbrica, in Francia, 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 è più adatta so, a un'impresa di questo tipo are such small al processo di innovazione o una grande impresa no portata in borsa con risorse finanziarie company, company listed on the stock exchange can rely on much much more Intanto abundant financial resources and then I would like to know whether there are other questions so domanda, you can perhaps start answering this question slowly please ok <laughs> uh, yes uh, so uh, when we look at uh, industries Uh, we look at different characteristics of industries by the technology, the markets, and the competition. Uh, uh, some industries are, have huge economies of scale. There's no way of having small firms. Um, some industries there are. And if it's uh, and design is very important, uh, if uh, uh, the uh, uh, plant and equipment is not too large that you need to set up as a, a small firm, you can have small firms. What the Italian Duster District shows is that you need to have uh, collective resources to make that work in terms of marketing, research, finance. 
Uh, so many of the functions have to be done collectively, either through tr trade associations or by the local governments. Uh, so uh, if you, and I, I, I wrote an article uh, quite a long time ago on, uh, called uh, The Managerial Revolution in the Developmental State, the Case of U.S. Agriculture. So if you take the history of U.S. agriculture where you had millions of family farms and it's recognized in the late 19th century that these farms, their productivity was very important to uh, exports, to the standard of living in the United States, uh, the government became heavily involved in providing the research, in uh, finance, uh, ultimately with the, when the New Deal came along, uh, to uh, allow those farms to... Uh, be productive. Now, it did create a problem, however, uh, and that is uh, once they became productive, uh, in areas where you had, uh, you know, mass distribution of, of, uh, of food and packaging and all kinds of things like that, you end up getting some of those family farms gobbled up by big actors. So there's one company, a guy who's a billionaire in Idaho, produces all the, the, the potatoes for McDonald's. <laughs> And that's, that's kind of, so you have a problem because of the characteristics then of the market. And uh, so sometimes if you want to have that competition, you have to, to maintain the competition. Uh, uh, it may be if you have to use really, really expensive equipment uh, and uh, that, that you can't do it on a small scale. Now, once you, the final thing is once you get into the knowledge economy, if you look at Silicon Valley, where people think of small firms. Well, they start off as small firms, but they become Cisco, Google, uh, you know, uh, 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 Oracle, all these companies are outside of Silicon Valley, Microsoft, uh, inside Silicon Valley, Intel. They become firms that employ tens of thousands of people. So, uh, yeah, new firm development where you have opportunities uh, in new, uh, new technologies might be very important. Uh, but uh, often those firms become very large as they, uh, and you know, if you want to be a, produce uh, semiconductors and manufacture them, there's only a few companies in the world can do this now. The Taiwanese are mainly doing it. So you have to look at various industries and there's different stages at which sometimes you can have small scale but uh, it changes. And uh, it's, sometimes it may be just because some people are trying to monopolize the industry. I'd argue more it's because of the dynamics of investment the kinds of organizations that are needed. So we can't uh, stay away from large businesses. We have to govern them. Thank you. Uh, um, Hillary Clinton, in her program, Hillary Clinton, in her electoral program, suggested to step in in the pharma industry because as such inequalities, as such discrepancies are well known to the, U, uh, the U.S. public. But then, of course, as we all know, Hillary Clinton was not elected and uh, Mr. Trump was elected instead. To what extent is the American public aware of these issues uh, and why the SEC, the Black um, Box, American um, stock exchange uh, um, supervisory body allow this black box to be listed on the stock exchange and we know that they do not generate any wealth. So is there only one question? So we'll let the professor answer. Okay, well, uh, the, uh, first of all, the, the New York stock, uh, the, the stock exchange in the United States. Uh, the NASDAQ stock exchange which was created in 1971. It was really the first uh, big example of internet working using computers uh, to create a price quote from a lot of different buyers and sellers. Uh, the National Association of Security Dealers Automated Quotation System, NASDAQ, it was for a long time called the over-the-counter markets because before then you had a lot of local dealers, security dealers, getting on the telephone, calling people, do you want to buy this stock or that stock? And now they could do it over an uh, electronic system and, and generate a highly liquid market, national market, and even that people, internationally people can invest in. That actually came from uh, the, uh, the U.S. government, the Security Exchange Commission, the regulator of the stock markets, 
seeing uh, that uh, there was a lot of spin-offs in the late uh, 50s and 60s uh, in electronics, which they called glamour stocks, and they said, we've got to get these companies on the stock market. Uh, and the idea was that they were going to raise money that way. Uh, but in fact, it, uh, it wasn't the way they raised money. It was the way people took money out of the companies, it, uh, and, and it made the stock market much more speculative. Compared to that, the New York Stock Exchange, although it's changed since then in competition, uh, you had to have much more of a profitability record, much more market capitalization. Uh, so people, when they uh, put their money into the New York Stock Exchange, uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't going to be as, as speculative. In fact, you, and it would take maybe 15 years before you could do initial public offering on average rather than three or four years. Now, uh, uh, nevertheless, the stock market has always been a gambling casino. Uh, even for uh, the best companies. And if you may know, uh, uh, the best companies in the United States, uh, I don't know if they use this term here, are called blue chip stocks. Uh, they started using this term a lot in the late 1920s and the boom of the 1920s, and these are the best companies on the New York Stock Exchange. The blue chip is the most valuable chip in a gambling casino. <laughs> That's, so it was recognized that nobody knows where the stock price is going to go. And of course, if you put your money into the stock market in 1929, you might have thought that you were safe with these companies, but you were not. And you know, it's only gotten worse. Uh, okay, so that's that's just a problem of the stock market, and it and it's it's it doesn't it reflects as much speculation and now manipulation, things like buybacks, as it does innovation. And when it's innovation, it's after the fact. People then see, oh, that's you know. Cisco was a fast-growing company, and they re recognize this after it's happened, and then everybody piles in and speculates, and then it goes up, and then it comes down. So the general public actually does not get the benefit of the, that innovation. Now, if you really, uh, if you know, if in 19, 2001 you bought Apple stock at $10 and you held it to September of 2012, it was worth $700. And uh, if you had the faith in that company and, and that's where you wanted to put your money, you would have made a lot of money because they actually came up with innovative products. But, but that's not the way most people are, are investing. Now, as far as Hillary Clinton's concerned, it was another part of the question was on the, the drug in, uh, prices. It happened that there, uh, during the campaign, uh, there were some really extreme price gouging. Uh, one was by a young, venture, uh, young uh, hedge fund guy who got control of a company and jacked up the price 750% of a drug that had been around for 60 years. And this caught people's attention. Uh, I don't know uh, that Hillary Clinton would have done anything if she had been elected uh, about drug prices. Uh, uh, I'm not sure the Democrats would have done anything about drug prices uh, because uh, they haven't done anything, despite, as I say, you know, people like members, of, you know, uh, uh, kind of an odd duck like, like uh, Henry Waxman saying this is greed, etc. They've just let these com these companies do what they want, and you know Tom Ferguson can probably tell you why. Uh, you know they uh, you know they get a lot of money from these these companies. Uh, you know no matter what political party they they're, they're in, and uh, uh, and so they go they go with the, the, the flow on this. Grazie. Se non ci sono altre, no, c'è una domanda in fondo. Un aspetto che non ho compreso. There is one thing um, I didn't nelle proposte fully che fa grasp. Il, il nostro relatore in terms of what you proposed as a possible MSV, cioè solution to MSV. Ridurre, cioè mettere un, diciamo, dare un limite massimo ai compensi per gli amministratori. A threshold uh, for the pay uh, of top executives and banning okay, buybacks. Di una but di uno stato, this is done eh, within the framework of uh, a regulation stato, that takes place at a national level. Eh, but if that happens within only one state and one regulatory system, then we achieve no, nothing because crede. these huge multinationals will find a way to gain their money elsewhere. Don't you think so? Okay. Uh, well. Speak to the question of buybacks. So, 
this is, this is much more uniquely an American phenomenon. It does exist in Europe, but we've collected data for the uh, S&P 350 Europe, and we find that there are, are they are spending all, all, all their money or more on distribution of shareholders, but it's more in dividends uh, than buybacks. And there's a difference. Dividends give shareholders who are holding shares uh, a stream of income. And so dividends are good as a form of a pay, let's say, for retirees or an income for retirees. But too much, if you're holding the stock, too much dividends, even forget about buybacks, can mean that the company is not generating the products of the future, not remaining competitive, and uh, then your stock may be worth very little if you try to sell it. Uh, so that can create a problem. At some point, the dividends will dry up. Uh, so uh, I think if, if uh, first of all, from a regulatory point of view, if you think of it as uh, the stock market is a way, is one place where, where the savers of a nation can put their money, uh, then uh, we want to regulate these companies so they can, if they have extra money that they can pay out dividends after everything else is done, they can pay out some dividends, but they are reinvesting and sustaining not only the company, but the employees and the incomes and often the incomes of the people who are going to be, who are paying into pensions. Now, uh, the multinationals uh, are, uh, are, what they do is they try to take what they're doing in the United States and extend that around the world, in, the, in this case, U.S. multinationals. So they try to do that with executive pay. Uh, they're not as successful uh, as they might want to be because there are sets of social norms and rule, rules. And in Europe, they vary from company to country to country. And so executive pay is not nearly, when you measure it properly, which we've done, is, is not nearly as high as it is in the United States. Um, but it probably is, is getting too high because in the United States it's way out of control. The United States, if you, the, the, the actual, C, by our data, the CEO to, to worker ratio for the 500 S&P 500 companies is about uh, 750, 800 to one. Okay, it should be 20 to one maybe. Okay, 20 to one be fine. Average pay, uh, 50,000 euros, top executive, a million euros. Uh, in fact, uh, that's probably even too much. Uh, People who rise to the top of a company, uh, uh, they're running a company. Uh, if they're getting paid anything more than half a million euros, they're doing incredibly well. <laughs> and why do they need more? Uh, and I, I, I think when we look comparatively, we can say that, in fact, uh, uh, companies and countries where people are paid, uh, top executives are paid less and they're more integrated with the organization, those organizations do better. Companies that are less financialized do better globally. And I could uh, talk about, I, I mentioned pharmaceuticals. I think some of the European countries are, companies are less financialized. Uh, so you, you have to su suppress the, the, uh, the, the, financi the, na the financialized character of these companies. Stock buybacks is one thing. It used to be illegal in most uh, European countries until the late 1990s. And then because of it was mainly because American companies were using their stock at that time to acquire other companies. Many companies in Europe started pushing uh, to uh, allow them to jack up their stock prices to give them an advantage in acquiring companies. The executives also saw the, this, the, gold, the golden lining here of uh, also getting their pay up. Uh, but they couldn't never have been able to do it in, in Europe to extent, except to some extent in, in Britain, but even there, nothing like the United States. Uh, because the social norms still uh, uh, constrain e executive pay and, 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 and some laws that, that surround that. Uh, the United States, everything has, has been just you know, thrown out to say whatever you can do to get up your pay, you're, you can do. And, uh, and often uh, the people who have the most power say, you know, you know, let's pay you even more to, to run down the company. There's an example of... Uh, uh, in the newspapers recently of Yahoo, uh, which uh, uh, basically they hired a, a woman from Google uh, to just get the stock price up so they could sell the company at the highest price and, uh, uh, um, and not really based on Yahoo, but based on their Chinese investments. In any case, you have all kinds of problems with this, but it's, it's, uh, it's something that if you could solve it in the United States, you'd be doing the rest of the world a great favor. <laughs> 
Grazie, grazie al professor William Lasonic. Thank you, thank you, professor William Lasonic.